He jumped in on this. Hello, sir. What's up, you guys? Hey, can hey, you hear us okay? Yeah. Can you hey, guys hear me okay? How do I sound? Loud and clear. Uh, pretentious. Fucking A. Like a dog <laughs> killer. Okay, yeah. That, I'm glad that it's like <laughs> that out of the way first. Uh, upon my recommendation of the pussy mm -hmm. uh, to be different and rebellious, he, he started reading uh, finally some good news, and he said... Uh, Zero stars because uh, there was a dog. Uh, dog gets killed in it. Yeah. Well, now, don't that was me being facetious. I did like the book. Don't give away the ending, but uh, yes, the dog. Uh, yeah, yeah. There is a dog that get that gets killed in it, and the dog uh, didn't deserve it. But what do you? What the fuck are you gonna do, man? Uh, zero you know? stars. That's what I'm going to do. It's a it's a post apocalyptic <laughs> uh, uh, story, right? Is that correct? right? Look, the dog doesn't get fucked or anything. The dog is killed in a painless manner, and it's repurposed for its true use in the uh, the new context of the world. No. Nah. <laughs> the new use, that, that dog is bred for joy and love. That dog deserved it. That was an evil dog that deserves to die. <laughs> uh, the dog. Uh, that makes two evil dogs. Off, off camera, the dog had mauled several babies and uh, <laughs> was also racist online. If you know this, yeah. the dog, uh, the dog oh. was a, the dog was a police dog and uh, had uh, had killed oh, several people. Oh, and it was racist yeah. online too. Is yes. that what you said? Yes, exactly right. Yeah, he did it online. That's yeah, that's horrible. The dog made an N tower on Twitter where it spelled out a very bad slur. <laughs> Is that what they call it? An N tower? I, an, I believe it's an N tower. Yes. Look, I don't know about these things. I'm just yeah, uh, you know, humble, did. humble hey. author. Yeah, the dog said the gamer word on Twitter, so it deserved it. That's exactly right. The dog was on a hot mic during an Xbox Live session, and <laughs> uh, it addressed an African American gamer by a very, very vicious word that I won't repeat here. The dog did this many, many times. Neighbor. The dog was known to do this. Yes. Um, if that's the case, then then we have to. Ben has to face the same fate. Its death was justified. I have never used the N word. And that's all that. I'll say about the issue. <laughs> so, I, I uh, so I haven't read finally some good news, but I can say that uh, the pussy was was very a very unassuming uh, synopsis, and even the first few chapters are very unassuming. But uh, I think that you know, despite it all, despite your best efforts, it actually did have a coherent, uh, cohesive. Um, you know, uh, theme to it. Well, the pussy is is a collection of blog posts, but I do try to ha have some kind of shape to the collections, and you know, they're in chronological order, so they're whatever whatever plot that it has really coincides with the plot of my life and whatever I'm thinking at the time. But it does, yes, it does have kind of an arc to it. And uh, I mean, I guess I did kind of spoil it in my review. You know some of the things that happened, but um, I actually found that it it had a genuine heart to it, despite being you know from the perspective of uh, I don't know like a a guy with mad game in the in the you know sex department, right? Right. Well, formerly a guy with mad game because he um, got old. Yeah. He, right. Exactly. And society itself changed, and the pussy market itself changed. It's harder to get laid now than it has been in many many years. But but I Tinder loved, kind of sucked the wind out of the sails. Yeah, I I, uh, I loved how he he like bragged like it. He was bragging. Is anybody there? I'm having a, having a hard time hearing you guys. How so? Oh, there we go. Now say, say that again. Okay. Well, I was just saying uh, the way he bragged about all the pussy he's had, like a general that's like out, like uh, naming off all his battle scars. You know. Right. And, that I have had more pussy than Julius Caesar or or this person or that person. Uh, you know, it's like this 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 character is like a genuine, like has a genuine soul almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, you know I uh, I used to get called a PUA blogger a lot, and it was never really true. Uh, I don't tell people how to get pussy, but I do talk about dating a lot, and it does make you feel something. Hearts. You mean pickup artist? Is that what PUA is? Sure, yeah. And I've never really laid a lot. Back when OKCupid okay was around, you could get laid by writing, so it worked out well for me. But uh, 
it's true. It, you know, there was a lot of anguish around that too, and I've always been candid about that. Mm. Um, but despite all these all these women uh, that that he congregates with, it, it's it ultimately, and I, I don't know. Can I say this without spoiling the the heart of the book? I don't know. Sure, go ahead. You know, I'm having a, I'm only hearing half of your questions, so say whatever, you know, but yeah, go ahead. Look, all the books have been out for a long time now, so. You hear that, Zach? Okay. I, what, what are you, still a bad what are you, thing. Uh, how, how, how are you not hearing me? Is it, ro is it sounding robotic? It's probably just my fucking internet cutting off, and it's because everybody in, around the world is on Zoom chats in quarantine, and it's just sucking up all the bandwidth on the entire globe. Okay. So there's nothing that can be done about it. I'm just like, assume, just try not to ask insightful questions and I'll just, <laughs> just try to ask dumb, simple shit. Okay. Um, well, basically at the heart of the book, despite all these women that he's, you know, been with, ultimately it's his cat that uh, loved him more than anything. And I don't think he was just anthropomorphizing the cat. I think genuinely that, that the cat was the only thing in his uh, thing or person in his, like, entity in his life that accepted him as he was yeah i mean the so that that part is real and that actually happened and i lived alone with my cat for nine years my beloved cat bud that i got at the burbank animal shelter and he was killed by a pit bull and it was the worst thing that ever happened to me you know a lot of people died during the writing of that book my dad died uh my ex-fiance died and um my cat died and uh that's kind of the middle of the book is those three deaths which crushed me this was uh, 2015, 2016, they were very hard years. So, you know, when you say there's a lot of pain in the book, I was really going through a lot of pain. Not to not to make people think that it's a fucking weepy book. I mean, most of it's about fucking and getting high, but uh, there's a lot of, you know, existential agony there too because those sad things kept happening to me. And it took me a long time, you know, and I'm still not over the death of my cat. I've got a cat now, a stray cat that lives in my backyard and hangs out in the garden that I feed and I, he comes around and I pet him and it's, very uh, reassuring to me. I feel like you know that part of me gets to live again. Yeah, cats. Cats are fascinating creatures. I I live with a small army of them, and uh, you know, I, I thought I thought I was gonna have problems with it in the beginning, but now it's like I I I know them like you know better than I know most human beings. What part of the country are you in? Tennessee. Why? Uh, I'm envious as a kid bought a gun before the, you know, for the pandemic and then having to experience the California gun laws you read so much about. I'm envious about people that live in other states. And I imagine that you can just go shoot a rifle out your back door at a beer can and have it be legal. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I don't own a firearm and I'm not, you know, I don't have a, what do you have to have a license and all that, but, uh, I don't really think firearms are for me, but that the, the gun laws here are probably more lax than in, you know, Cal California. Yeah. Like I had to take my gun. I had to sight it in, right? You get a rifle and you have to sight it in. I did not know this before I bought one. And it, and my, the process for sighting in my particular gun is a giant pain in the ass. Uh, and there's, you have to fucking shoot it and you have to see where it's off and then you have to adjust the sights to get it back on. And, uh, to do that, you have to go to a range. You're supposed to put a this particular gun is a Ruger 10-22. You're in a bench vise, and then whack on the sight with a brass punch and a hammer until it's right again, and then shoot it again to see you know how much more you need to fucking whack it. And uh, it's impossible to do in the state of California. You have to take it to a fucking gun range and then go back to a bench vise and fucking whack it again, and it's a nightmare. So my fantasy, uh, if I lived in Tennessee, what I would have is a fucking arsenal that I'd be shooting in my backyard constantly. Uh, firing into the air, blowing up gas cans. I would be living a, an extremely uh, fucking savage backwoods life out there. <laughs> um, but maybe my picture of Tennessee is a little more of a stereotype than reality. No, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah. Are you guys near Nashville or are you kind of more out in the, out in the woods? I am uh, I'm probably, I don't know, five or six hours away from Nashville. Yeah, you're on the complete other side of the state, Jeremy. Yeah. Where we uh, both are. Yeah. About two hours away from Knoxville. Okay. Uh, 
But yeah, I mean, I'm in Ohio, and you can do all those things here too. Nice, right yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Iowa, and you can pretty much do that as well as long as you're not in Des Moines, and I live Fuck. in Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking a man. It sounds like you are uh, too like genuine to be living in Cali. Like you're too like relaxed to be in in such a high stress state where everybody's motives are questioned and this and there's cancel culture around yes. every step and people constantly practicing this knitting circle bullshit on each other you know uh you must be going mad there if you still live. well the thing about california is it really is a physically beautiful place to live it's it's 80 degrees and sunny most days there's beautiful beaches uh beautiful mountains and uh it's nice and the food's really good and a lot of the women are really hot, but I, it is frustrating in some respects. Like I'm probably, you know, unmarried and childless because I live in California. It's certainly very expensive. And, and as you correctly observe, uh, there, you know, people are very driven and, uh, can be very mercenary. And there is a lot of woke horse shit going on constantly. Everybody is constantly spouting this woke shit, which, I'm not even technically against in terms of, you know, politics. However, I'm fucking sick of hearing about it. And people do it in a real performative way that's just fake. They do it for social status reasons. So, but I don't know. If I move, man, I'm going to move to Southeast Asia. I'm not going to, I probably won't move somewhere else in the States. Wait a minute. Are you, are you being, is that, uh, is that like hyperbole or are you serious that you would rather live in Southeast Asia? Well, I'm 44 years old and I want to have a biological child. Uh, and a different place in America to do that, you know, to go to a place where, you know, Los Angeles is not a place where relationships, marriage and children are normal or are, are considered wholesome. Even it's very career driven. So, uh, how, how, like, if I'm going to fucking move somewhere though, like moving to another state is about the same as moving to Southeast Asia. It's just, you know, getting all my shit together, fucking making new friends, uprooting my entire life. I might as well go somewhere where you can live on 10 grand a year and sleep with 18 year old jungle girls. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can uh, move to Southeast Asia like a new Chiche did. Like who? New Chiche. Do you know him? No, hey, who uh, is he? I'll he was published him. through Nine Banded Books. Uh, he, he oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I mean, I know Nine Banded Books. No, Mountainhead, not Fountainhead. <laughs> <laughs> Complete opposite. Didn't oh, I read cool. one of his books that you sent me, Ben? Stupid Baby? That's him, right? Yeah, Stupid Baby. The chat yeah. book is him. Yeah. Like he writes about being in uh, Southeast Asia and sleeping with prostitutes and shit there. That's what you do, and it's pretty great. Although it does, it that's another thing that kind of wears on your soul. I mean, when I go there, I do a lot of you know scuba diving and shit, and I usually only fuck hookers for a couple of days. Um, there are guys that expatriate to have sex with young prostitutes there, and you see them walking around, and they're not smiling, like they're on their way to fuck a nineteen-year-old that looks like a model with a pussy that can crush coal into diamonds, <laughs> and they're not smiling. It looks like they're going to work. So that's probably not the solution. And so to answer your question, it probably is hyperbole. But I like living here in L.A. because like, I've got a beautiful place and I'm looking out over this nice little valley and the sun is I'm here all the time. And it, it's a nice place to be, except the dating life is so hard. I think if you didn't have to work so hard to live here, that would be another plus, right? Like, and I make enough off my books to live in cheaper parts of the country. So that might end up being something that I do. So you pro you actually profit from being an author. That's very rare. these. But days. I don't make enough off my books to live in California. Oh, um, so, so you're not a full-time author then basically. All right. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. I can now. Yeah. So you don't profit from, uh, I mean, you, you, you are, you're not a full-time author, basically, is what I'm saying. No, I have a, I have a nine-to-five day job as well. So for the past five years, I've been writing books and working full-time. And uh, that's another reason that I'm single is because I have two jobs, basically. So 
it is in my old age it is getting to be a little much i wouldn't mind working part-time or just letting myself be a little more lazy mm -hmm. and i should mention i should plug my new book savage spear of the yeah. unicorn yeah, I'm pulling it up now. on amazon now i'm, I'm getting there um, the, new, the new york times called it uh the best book of the year no yeah, they, uh, that's what <laughs> I really like that um, that fake uh, blurb by. Well, Are they I mean, it's not fake, but Michiko Kakutani. Yeah, um, I've sure. I thought about like making a uh, a fake Michiko Kakutani blurb for one of my books that just says something like, "This book is poo poo pee pee doo doo." <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you yeah. think Michiko Kakutani would actually think of the book? I so, think she would probably think it was garbage, but uh, <laughs> you know that's her. Like she's the New York Times. Uh, you know, former New York Times book reviewer, so she kind of has to think a lot of things are shit. I mean, I think she negatively reviewed Infinite Jest. Um, I think towards the end of her tenure there, she was doing, you know, it was pure SJW shit, and she was positively reviewing every, who knows, you know, every, you know, yeah. re reviewing based on identity, but I don't I know that for uh, sure. Well, and I remember, who cares? Uh, like, I was. I remember Norman Mailer once said that she was a, a kamikaze warrior who hated straight white men or something like that. <laughs> it could be. I mean, there's certainly no shortage of them out there. What, what does it matter now? I mean, I'm never. You know, I'm never going to get any institutional support. At least, I'm never planning on it. So, who gives a shit, really? I think my stuff is pretty review proof. It's not meant to be you know, criticized in that way. Like it, it's really, if it's not for you, it's not for you. But for, if you're a horny dude or a certain kind of honest woman, then it's for you. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that was uh, an interview you did where you uh, spoke positively of that uh, cat person story that you know, yes. went viral. I really liked the cat person story. I thought it was a very honest, uh, honest, work by a woman writer that gave perspective into you know inside a woman's head which you never get yeah I, she no, was I, the first person to do it i mean the other things that she's written are not quite on that level but she's you know that one story, short story is enough to justify her entire existence yeah what, i remember what, what, what i can y'all bring up a link i'm i don't know what you're all talking about it's called a uh, cat person by what the fuck is her name Kristen rupenian that person by what the fuck is her name? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's her pen name. What the fuck is her name? <laughs> yeah, it was published in the New Yorker and it went viral, which was pretty interesting. It's like you don't see things that like get published in the New Yorker and like the average person cares about it. Like, yeah, it I mean, more. and it sort of got swept up in like everything does in a social justice related discussion when I think the story transcended that. I, you know, um, I wasn't sure how I felt about it when I first read it, but you know when I went back and reread it after the um, the hype around it died down, I liked it a lot more because yeah I could see it as just like a honest story about a woman with a bad, um, well, somewhat bad uh, dating experience. Hello. Yeah. yeah. I, lo I lost you guys. Oh. I didn't, whatever whatever the last part of what you said was, I didn't hear it. I was like, oh, I, I said, um, it, it, I read it after the hype died down because I wasn't sure how I felt about it the first time. Right. Um, and I did like it a lot more the second time because, yeah, it, it's like you said, it, it's a very um, honest, straightforward uh, story about a woman's, um, you know, dating experience. So Frank Edler is asking, is Delicious Tacos work similar in tone to Chad uh, Kultgen? You know, I started reading Average American Male. I think my stuff is uh, is more fun to read. I mean, from what I've read from you, I'd uh, compare it to like a modern day Celine. Yeah, I just read Celine for the first time. I just read uh, Journey to the End of the Night. Okay. Um, it's a hard thing to read in translation. It's one of these things that I've always meant to learn French to read, along with reading Huelbeck in French. But I'm realizing now that I'm probably too lazy to learn French on that level. Um, so yes, yeah, Celine was fascinating. Although Celine had some long, boring parts too. Once he got back to France from Africa, uh, it you know it didn't quite have the same pop as his experiences in the trenches in World War One and then in the fucking Congo. Yeah, that's true. I think 
one of the funniest parts in Journey to the End of the Night is uh, where he goes to like a public toilet in America, I think, and he's just absolutely horrified by it. Yes, that part was hilarious. Like what? What was it? Just, just the, like an existential issue, like upon reflecting upon urinals, or what? Well, no, he just goes in the bathroom, and the way he describes it, it's like he's describing like hell or something. Like right. He, he's so disgusted by it. He's talking about like a giant. Uh, I think like there used to be like huge, huge. I think it's underground, like public restroom. Right. I'm thinking of a particular one in New York City that might even still exist. Um, and I think he's just talking about like the behavior of, uh, of dozens of men being in there at the same time, but maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah. Something like that. He has a similar scene in a uh, uh, journey to the or not uh, death on the installment plan, right. which I didn't like as much, but uh, there is a hilarious scene where the, he and his family are on a boat when he's a kid and he uh-huh. like describes everybody getting seasick. And it's like a, a vaudeville comedy act that ends with him, you know, getting thrown into the bathroom by his mother and his head in the toilet. (laughs) But yeah, Um, it is kind of interesting that you were kind of associated with the, uh, with the manosphere, I guess you would call it because, and that you were kind of considered like a PUA blog when I read you and honestly, you were a lot like more honest, more entertaining than a lot of those other guys. Well, thank you for saying so. You know, I, it was an so back in 2012, which is when I started deliciousTacos.com, which is my website that everybody should fucking go to. Um, that was a different scene. Like Hartiste was still around, and he was still talking about pussy. Uh, Roosh still had just sort of a more straightforward like blog about his experiences, and things got more political over time. Like Cernovich was still around talking about pussy. Uh, somehow. Even before the Trump campaign, uh, the Manosphere, which I was always sort of only tangentially involved with, took a turn to the right that I didn't share. Not that I give a shit what anybody's political beliefs are, but I don't think there was a shortage of political discussion around. I don't think anybody else ever needed to be talking about politics. I was still interested in pussy. And... (laughs) I mean, look, people, I guess people write about pussy for five years and then you need something else to do. I mean, it is true that there's only so much you can milk out of that tit. However, uh, I think a lot of people sort of went looking for bigger franchises. You always have to expand. You always have to be moving forward creatively. And I think most people wanted to move forward more persona and fame and I always wanted to move forward into being a quote, real writer, end quote. I always wanted to write a novel and I wanted to write actual literature. So that's where I diverged from those guys. My hope was always that Roosh would be writing fiction. My hope is that everybody would be writing fiction. Uh, but I understand, I, like I understand why that's not something people want to do. I mean, it doesn't pay any money and you don't get very famous doing it. I liked Roosh's turn, obviously because I'm a Christian, but his turn from uh, complete dismissal of uh, the whole pickup uh, type thing. Now, I, I don't know if he's changed since then, but just that era of Roosh was freaking cool. Yeah, he got philosophical. I, w- I will never trash Roosh because he did have philosophical depth to him uh, along with the trolling. He was like Howard Stern. He always had to do like a Howard Stern troll, like his satire articles that rape should be legal. All the Return of King stuff was just sort of publicity stunts. And then he always had a more philosophical side. His religious zeal now is strange to me because it's so different. Look, I believe in God. I pray every morning now, right? I found God too, but it affected my work slowly, whereas it affected his work instantaneously and in a complete 180 yeah, which just like, seems strange the thing is like i do give roosh uh, credit that he did take most that he put his money where his mouth is and took most of those books out of print yeah uh, i'm sure a lot of those other guys who you know took that turn wouldn't do that but yeah I it see, is kind I of certainly funny. wouldn't <laughs> but it's kind of funny like when you look at all those people who were you know 
used to be writing about, you know, getting women. Now when you go to their blogs, it's basically like, you see, when you examine the skull of, of the Negro, it, it, yeah. it shows that they have a propensity towards crime and deviant behavior. That kind it's of shit. so weird. The right-wing shit is so weird. And again, I have no beef with right-wing politics. But it's so strange. I think people just need something to be really into. Mm. Would you say that you're you're more apolitical than anything? That's what sure. I. Sure, yeah. I hold. I mean, I guess if I if I gave a shit, I would hold left wing beliefs. But I've given up. My belief is that you can't. Nothing's going to change. Society is what it is. Or if it does change, it'll be in ways that you can't control. Uh, my, if I try to do good in the world, it's by making people feel less alone by writing honestly and by trying to help my neighbors and my friends. And, you know, I'm sober too. So I try to help other alcoholics recover from alcoholism. And that's where I try to do good. I don't think message helps anybody, especially because I'm a dirt bag who fucks whores. So nobody wants to hear <laughs> what I think about the welfare state or racism. Nobody gives a shit, nor should they. But there's a there's also an issue. There's this Tonight Show issue, right? Like guys who want to blog all the time are on the Tonight Show, and they got to give a monologue every night. So eventually, you either become really repetitive talking about the same shit all the time, or you take on topical subjects, which are always kind of hack. And if you're writing about political shit, you always have something to react to. Trump always does something that you have now you have material on there's always some new social justice outrage that you can then troll against so it is a franchise bit and it's a fountain of material and that's another reason people do it probably but it never appealed to me i think part of it is also when i started blogging i was posting every day i posted you know 300 and change posts in my first year which was insane and then when i was putting the pussy together my collection or when I was putting hot naked tits together, my first collection, I was reading, I had to, you know, I was reading back everything I'd written and the stuff that was topical was not at all evergreen. Nobody gave a shit about like the stuff I was writing about Barack Obama. Nobody gives a fuck about now. And I've since tried to focus on something that you can read right now and still read 10 years from now. And political shit ain't it. Right. Right. About the only like political stuff you can write that's evergreen is theory. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to I, write think, that. I think, uh, it's fun to read that, you know, yeah, I like reading it too, but you know, it's most, for most people don't. <laughs> it's fun to read, uh, political stuff that day. My feeling is always like it's creatively bankrupt. If something is not going to be fresh two days from now, if you really, if you feel like you have to jump on something and post it today to get page views, then it's not worth doing. That's my yeah, view. It has a reactionary element to anything that's not universal. It's yeah. not going to click with people, and it's not going to click with you too. Because I mean, I, I mean, as a, as a writer, because you're not really engaging. Like I guess your imagination, you're just reacting. Yes. Now I don't want to trash people who do that. Because if you are blogging, and especially if you're starting blogging, you do need to post all the time. So don't be afraid to do that while you're learning how to blog and while you're building an audience. It's now, just an approach that I no longer take. Whereas I did use that in writing about politics. I don't want to criticize you or trash you. There's valid opinions to be had on that shit. And you, you need it for material when you're, you know, when you start out, but as you mature, you'll find that the th stuff that you're proudest of is much more evergreen. I'm, so, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm one thing I'm high. And, and the second thing is that I have no idea <laughs> evergreen. What, what is this? You keep referring to evergreen. Was that like a state if of a problem? piece of content is evergreen, it means that it's just as uh, valuable creatively now as it was if it was written 10 years ago. It's like so timeless. The timeless Bible is evergreen. Like a, a the Iliad market, is evergreen. Yeah. Uh, whereas something that's in The Guardian is not. 
Gotcha. Yeah, so um, Spear of the Savage Unicorn uh, is definitely an interesting title, but uh, for the most part, you tend to write books where um, the title is kind of somewhat sarcastic or not necessarily indicative. So what's, right. uh, what's this one about? You're talking about Savage Spear of the Unicorn, the new one? Yeah. Savage Spear of the Unicorn, available on Amazon now. Uh, this is another collection like The Pussy. Uh, the Pussy was from 2012 to 2016. This one ranges from 2015 to 2020. So it's later stories, more recent stuff. I have a story you know, I have a story about Bitcoin in there. I have a story about Mark Zuckerberg. I have a horror story in there called What's Out There. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got fucking coronavirus. And like The Pussy, it's in chronological order and it opens in a very cynical place and I tried to end it in a very hopeful place. A lot of the stuff in the book is from my blog, but there's a couple new things in there that are some of the best stuff that I've done, especially the two new things at the end. And uh, the unicorn story that gave the book its title is about a guy who... And it has kind of an ironic ending. And so the whole book is about desire and what happens when you get what you want. Um, but it's also about fucking pussy and jerking off and, you know, Donald Trump and all the usual shit. You got to work that in somewhere. That's right. Um, so who are some of your influences? I do remember uh, reading your blog a while back, and I do remember you mentioning people like uh, Alice Munro and, and such as your influences. Yeah, I like Alice Munro a lot although I haven't read her in a while when I, I got the collected works of Alice Munro from the library and I just read the whole thing in the bath in a couple of days, you know, I like Michelle Huelbeck is the best writer living in the world right now. Obviously I like Charles Bukowski a lot. Um, one of my favorite novels is last temptation of Christ by Nikos Kazantzakis. That's a great um, novel. I like, uh, Kurt Vonnegut a lot. Um, who else is great? I'm reading some Raymond Carver short stories right now. They're incredible. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of that too. Um, and who's then, the best? Who's the know, best writer you said living earlier now? Earlier, Dostoevsky. Sorry. I like Nikolai Gogol was a big influence on this book in particular. So a couple of the Russian guys, you know, Tolstoy stories and Pushkin and guys like that. So who's the best uh, writer living now that you said? Uh, Michel Huelbeck, author of the Elementary Particles. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, I have his uh, new novel, um, Serotonin, and I'm really looking forward to reading that. It's incredible. People are calling it one of his minor works, and I disagree. I think it's, I think it stands up with uh, anything he's done. Yeah. Well, not quite. Elementary Particles and Possibility of an Island are his two like big masterpieces, but whatever is my personal favorite. Yes, whatever is is also you can you know if people who are listening want to read Huelbeck, I would recommend reading it in chronological order. So start with this book called Whatever, which is very short and uh, yeah. very has a very clear central message that is true about yeah. the sexual marketplace. Yeah, and Zach, um, I would definitely recommend you read um, uh, Submission because it, it's it is a, a book about conversion. But it's a book about conversion to Islam. It's very cynical, so I think you might find the viewpoint interesting at the very least. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm losing you guys again. I just missed whatever, whatever insight you just had. I'm I'm afraid I missed it. Well, uh, my uh, Zach, one of our co-hosts, recently converted to Christianity, and I think he would find submission in, as an interesting viewpoint on that, even though it's very cynical about the concept. Yeah, I mean, submission is a book about France taking on Islam as their national religion and this the hero is this intellectual and he eventually converts because they tell him that they're going to give him three 15 year old wives which is exact exact what I think we lost him is oh, he no. still on the thingy can you see him yeah he's there we can't hear you tacos hey man can you hear me now yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. there we go it's really weird calling you delicious tacos. Like it's like th there's no end to the irony of of talking to a, an author, plugging his work, and he identifies as delicious taco. I mean, yeah, it's weird, but I have to have a fake name because I have a day job, and also it just stuck. I've been writing under this name for almost ten years, so for better or for worse, that's that's what that's what they call me. I think uh, you, think you have to have a fake name if you live somewhere other than LA. Yeah, I mean, 
As far as fake names go, it's pretty good. It's impossible to misspell. Nobody else owns the trademark. There's not an actual restaurant called Delicious Tacos. So if you Google Delicious Tacos, you get me. So I'm happy. Everybody likes it. Nobody hates tacos. There may be uh, some advantages, like uh, um, product-wise, to to calling yourself that name because it's quirky enough that it will drive up the curiosity factor, right? Wait, this guy calls himself Delicious Hello? Tacos. You know, I've got to check this out. You know, what's that about? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh my dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're here. Fuck. This is yeah. This sorry. This fu fucking technology is fucked. Ted Kaczynski was right. Computers are horseshit. Uh, all no, technological he's... society should be destroyed. People should be blowing up transformers next to server farms, and uh, we all need to re return to primitive life. I got to get going in a couple of minutes anyway. So I, I. But um. Before we before we do uh, convert to uh, Unabomber or whatever, can you uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, but there might may, may be some financial advantages to, you know, calling yourself delicious tacos because like curiosity factor, this guy calling himself this really weird name. It is know? true. And it pops. It's not a bad name. It's right. intriguing to people. Who knows? I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll fucking, I, I'd like to release my next book, at least acknowledging my real name. But in order to do that, I, you know, have to have enough money to not have to work for a fairly long time. I'm getting there. I'm getting close. I'm saving up like a fucking monk. So maybe I'll get to show face and uh, name fag you know, in a couple of years. As someone who's kind of having, who's kind of stepping up and coming into, into his own, at, you know, as far as that, you know, like a late bloomer who's having to learn on the go, you know, some things that, uh, that, you know, uh, my uh, family used to uh, take care of, you know, like what are some what are some things you would advise like meal wise, you know, to save costs and everything? Do you just eat a lot of ramen noodles or what? Uh, I usually I eat pretty well, but I cook my own meals. So my typical meal will be a nice French baguette, a pork chop and some Brussels sprouts that I saute. It's really delicious. You know, I'm loving the quarantine. I'm cooking my own meals every day. And uh, I'm healthier than I've ever been, I think. I'll usually have some nice fresh fruit for dessert, perhaps some organic blueberries. Uh, I cut costs because I fucking live by myself, so I've got no one to support. I also make tons of money, so you know, there are that few helps. Things, there are a few things as, uh, as amazing as, as like just a good navel orange. Correct, but, yeah. Fruit... Seriously. Uh, Eat, get some broccoli, maybe some spinach. I always try to have uh, some green vegetables every day. I try to eat some carrots every day. Um, probably a good pound, pound and a half of meat to to help with my weightlifting. But I don't take any supplements or vitamins or anything. Every time I take a vitamin, it just gives me diarrhea. Hmm. What the? Uh, what, what is your average like? You know, bench pressing. You know, I think. I'm a pretty skinny dude, so three drops at 205 is a very good bench press day for me. Uh, probably less now because I've been quarantined for three months, so I've only been able to work out with my 95 pounds worth of backyard weights. So I've never been especially strong, but I look good because I have low body fat. Hmm. So uh, are you still a connoisseur of... Uh of the feline, you know, the, the, the pussy. So Absolutely. Speak. I'm a fan of the pussy, both, uh, both literal and figurative. Yeah. But I mean, are you, are you still successful? You got game? still? Not really. No, uh, I'm sober. So I go to bed at nine 30. Uh, I can't go on drinks dates anymore. Nobody fucking wants to date me in this town. So I got a couple girls I bang once in a while, but my romantic life is over. And so you can't flex you can't use your like publishing uh, credits to flex and impress. Yeah, that's one. That's why I want to break my anonymity eventually. Because when I was showing face, I would have women write to me and want to meet me, and that stopped happening once I stopped showing face. Not that my face is anything special, but it's it's good looking enough that 
that and my personality are an appealing package. Just my personality is apparently not. So I would like to be able to show my my at least you know, 5.5 out of 10 bone structure to the world so that <laughs> women will start sleeping with me again. You know, uh, when you were talking about uh, in, in the, in that book, the pussy, you were the, 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 the chapter you devoted to um, fast food, you know, it, it was really funny how the guy was going on and on. The manager was talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the queuing oven, you must right. never call it a microwave. It's yes. funny how they get really hung up on stuff like that. Cause I work in a restaurant, so I know all about that. And how they get really hung up on these denial, these things where they're in denial, you know, yes, this, yes, much, this, this much, this many thousands of dollars, it cannot be a microwave, but it is. you know. It's, right, right. I think at McDonald's, the issue with the microwave is that they don't want people to, they didn't want the customers to hear you say the word microwave because then they, they associate microwaves with cheap shit food instead of freshly prepared food. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, what, what are, what are some like things on your bucket list, uh, of, of writing that you'd like to cross off? Like, have you ever wanted to write like a straight, like, I don't know, fiction novel, or is it just strictly like loose autobiographical, like literary stuff, you know, for the rest so of your the next, the thing that I'm thinking about now is, uh, is my next novel, which is called True Love. And it's going to take me, I think, at least a couple of years to write. And I'm writing it slowly, but I've started work on it. And, uh, you know, finally some good news is like a tight, tight, short novel. And this is going to be a little more long and sprawling and uh, go a little deeper into maybe my own past and go a little deeper into some fantastical places. And... So that's what I'm concentrating on now. And that's after that, I can drop dead or I can retire. Hmm. How many words was uh, finally some good news or do you not remember? Uh, probably about 40,000. Okay. So a very short novel. Might even technically be a novella. All right. Well, you said you, uh, you, you could only give us a little bit of time, so, but I appreciate you giving us that time. And uh, it was an honor to speak with you. You know, like I said, I've uh, I I've uh, really warmed up to your work. You know, I, I thought you were just average at first. Then I started reading more and more. And I'm like, man, this guy does have a gift. Thank you. I, you know, I, I missed the first part of what you said, but I came in as you were saying that I'm good. So thank you. That's <laughs> awesome. The, that's the important part. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. All right, you guys, I think I, I think I got to jump. Okay, well, I'll definitely uh, be picking up some of your books as well. I've read some of your blog posts, and I would definitely uh, love to read some of your uh, your full length stories. Guys, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me on. And I'm sorry that I couldn't hear you so well. Maybe we can do it again uh, when you know I'll get a better in internet connection, like a wired connection, and we can try so that I can hear everybody's questions, etc. Best of yeah. luck in the future. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we definitely love to have you back sometime. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate it, and I'll talk to you soon, man. All right, talk to you later, man. Right. Well, I would say this is uh, this has been a pretty successful, eventful episode, and uh, yeah, I think we're I think we can uh, we can wrap there, unless there's something else you guys wanted to talk about. 